from the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. Maybe we assess with moderate confidence it might have come out of the lab. What does that mean? Well, that means you didn't have any sources in the lab in 2019, mm-hmm. and apparently in 2023, you still don't have any sources in the lab. And that's your whole reason for existing. So that's pretty damning. This is your host, Scott Bertram, and that's Sam Thaddis. He's author of Beyond Repair, The Decline and Fall of the CIA, on Hillsdale's campus recently to give a lecture, The Rise and Fall of the CIA. We'll talk in depth about that topic a little later on in today's program. First, we're joined by Dr. Adam Carrington, Associate Professor of Politics, William and Patricia Lamoth Chair in the U.S. Constitution at Hillsdale College. Dr. Carrington, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. You also see him writing in many places, the Chicago Tribune and elsewhere, including occasionally National Review. And that's where we find this piece, how the 17th Amendment ruined federalism. So people might have some of the amendments memorized. What's the 17th all about? So the 17th changed the way that we select United States senators. Senators until the early 1900s when this amendment was passed had been chosen by state legislatures. So interesting Lincoln-Douglas debates. The people weren't voting for Lincoln or Douglas when they were debating to be the Senate. They were he, the, the, Lincoln and Douglas were saying, vote for our party for the state legislature so they will <laughs> vote for us. Um, that was changed to what the system is now by the 17th Amendment, whereby the people of the state directly vote for senators. So you went from state legislative selection to, 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 to that direct vote by the people. What were the arguments at the time? For what reasons did advocates push for this change some 110 years ago? Two related One was to make us more democratic, the argument that we are a government that is ultimately of the people, uh, that it's from and by the people, as Lincoln famously said, and therefore doesn't it make more sense for the people to directly choose their representative in the Senate as they were already doing all along in the House of Representatives. So you had that. Well, why, why, why not do the same for both? The other that was related was less corruption. There was the accusations that when you have one layer of politicians, and this is not a ridiculous worry, selecting another layer of politicians, you can have backroom deals, you mm-hmm. can have corruption, you can have things like that. And yes, there were actually instances of that, not pervasive I from anything I've, I've been able to dig up. But so those are the two ideas, more democratic, hopefully clearing out a level of potential for corruption. But for the founders, why did they set things up in this manner? What were the advantages of a, of a state centric legislative chamber within the national government? Well, they didn't say it was more corruption. So <laughs> um, so, yes, what the, what their arguments were was twofold. One, protecting federalism. And you could say, well, the people, the the states are still selecting, right? It's the people, the states. Well, the difference for the founders would have been that the people, a person is an American and a Michigander or wherever you're from, maybe even think of themselves as from the city. So they have these different perspectives that they may be voting based on. So they may not only be thinking of their senator in a state-centric way. That's much less likely with state legislatures. They Mm -hmm. are part of the government of the state. So they're going to be choosing who is going to look out for our interests, defend our interests, articulate our interests as a state, as a state government. And so that was their, their, their first. The other was related that a big thing that they pushed with Congress was they wanted it to deliberate well. And deliberation was going to be a means for making better laws because you would think about it, you'd refine it, you'd pool your different perspectives. Well, the House was already a very national perspective because it's based on population, also more local because it was based in districts. 
the Senate, by having its state centric perspective and also, you know, equal senators per state was going to bring that different perspective and hone maybe some of the blind spots or excesses of the House, just as the House was meant to do the same for the Senate. Has the direct election of senators since that time contributed to the growing power of the national government? I think so. I wouldn't claim it's the only thing. Rarely does something that large have only one cause. But I do believe it made the Senate less dedicated to protecting state powers as state powers and made the Senate more willing to go along with, for example, national indirect takeovers of things. So a lot of what's happened in the 20th century and 21st is the national government has co-opted the states by offering them money to do what the national government can't do directly, Medicaid, Mm -hmm. things like that. And I think the nature of the Senate now, the senators were more likely to only see that as a perk for the people of the state and less likely to be worried about how that might undermine the independence of the states. Now, by the way, the state legislature's went along with a lot of these things too. Mm-hmm. But I think that that broke down that that focus on the prerogatives of state governments as state governments. And I think that that has helped undermine the power of the states vis-a-vis the national government. Has the country changed in tangible ways in the past 100 years, size, population, politics writ large, that might remind us why the election by state legislatures was a decent idea? I think that we tend to think that the trend is all national and internationalization of life, economically, politically. But every once in a while, you have instances that show us how important state governments still are. COVID, I think, was one where the differences in situations, populations, and the powers that states still retained were important. And we sort of saw that. The other is we still see that as much as we try to nationalize policies, there are still local matters that are inextricably local. Mm -hmm. So think of the when you have a drought that doesn't really affect Michigan that much. We have water everywhere versus out in New Mexico, out in, 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 in Nevada or places like that. And the idea that you wouldn't have a national body like the Senate that is putting a check on the national government's attempts to maybe uniform those kind of policies and therefore probably not adequately address the needs and the rights and the interests of the people involved. I think things like that keep keep coming up, whether it be COVID, whether it be water rights with droughts, all sorts of other things that I think uh, continue to matter and say – we need to keep all the bulwarks that the nation, that the Constitution put in place to protect the states as their own entity with their own independence and their own independent will, not just powers. You can read this piece at nationalreview.com, how the 17th Amendment ruined federalism. You might read it. You might agree. Then we have to get to the point of, will things change? And while there are still occasions in which the state has a say in, say, uh, replacing a U.S. senator who dies or a U.S. senator who resigns, the power largely lies with the people through direct election of the senators at this point. It's hard for me to imagine an occasion in which the people say, oh, well, we'll give this right back to our our, our, our state governments to, to, to appoint our senators. That's a That's a tough hill to climb. Absolutely. And I think this is where there's always a tension within, I think, our republic. And one is that our problems need more democracy, more control of the people, because outside forces, oligarchic or of elites or otherwise, are intruding in. And then there's the argument that the people themselves can be the problem because we're human beings, fallible. And there needs to be channeling and, and, and limitation and mitigation to make us make better decisions. Throughout American history, we started with a lot of the latter, those channelings, those mitigations, those attempts to, to make us better that way. It's hard to make an argument in a government that is based on the will of the people to increase those, mm-hmm. much less maintain them. Uh, Tocqueville really did say – 
when he was here as a Frenchman in the 18 in 1830s and, and writing in the 1840s, the pull of our republic tends to be toward more democracy and less restraints on the democracy, at least formally, uh, maybe outside of formally, there are other trends going on, but at least formally, that's the case. So no, I don't see that genie being put back in the bottle. Well, you can still complain about it, right? <laughs> I, 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 that, 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 I think that's mostly what academics do. Uh, yeah. Dr. Adam Carrington, Associate Professor of Politics, William and Patricia LaMoff, Chair in the U.S. Constitution at Hillsdale College. You can find this piece at nationalreview.com. How the 17th Amendment Ruined Federalism. Dr. Carrington, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thanks for having me on. Up next, Sam Faddis joins us. He's the author of Beyond Repair, The Decline and Fall of the CIA. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hello, this is Kyle Mernon, Director of Online Learning here at Hillsdale College, and I'm excited to announce that we've brought Hillsdale's popular and free online courses to the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. And we're starting with one of my favorites, The Second World Wars, a course taught by Victor Davis Hanson and Hillsdale President Larry Piarn. After listening to all eight episodes, you'll have a clear picture of why the war was fought and how the Allied powers ultimately triumphed. The Hillsdale College Online Courses Podcast which I co-host with my colleague here, Juan Davalos, pursues Hillsdale's mission to provide all who wish to learn the education necessary to preserve the civil and religious liberties of America. And we want you to be a part of it at podcast.hillsdale.edu. Subscribe now to the Hillsdale College Online Courses Podcast to hear new episodes every week with additional commentary and insights from our team. Go to podcast.hillsdale.edu to learn more. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to check out the Hillsdale College Podcast Network at podcast.hillsdale.edu. We're joined by Sam Faddis. He's author of Beyond Repair, The Decline and Fall of the CIA, He's here on Hillsdale's campus as part of our CCA and giving a lecture, The Rise and Fall of the CIA. You can find him and follow his work at andmagazine.substack.com, andmagazine.substack.com. Sam, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I want to start first a little bit with your own story. What led you to join the CIA? How would you characterize your time at the agency? You know, I I left the United States Army, and I suppose I was casting about trying to figure out, uh, okay, where where am I going? And literally, as corny as this sounds, I saw an ad to join the Directorate of Operations <laughs> back in the days when those things were actually hard copy. Sure. And thought, hey, that sounds like exactly what I'm looking for and probably didn't even know I was looking for. You know, when I was overseas and I was running ops and Washington, D.C. left us alone, it's the best job in the world. Important, fun, exhilarating. Can you take us through a little about the OSS and the origin of our intelligence agencies? Right. So the OSS was the Office of Strategic Services. It was formed in 1942 after we had entered the Second World War. And the United States prior to that had no such thing. There was no CIA. or And it was set up by a guy, guy named General Donovan at the request of the president, FDR to run clandestine operations, conduct covert action, always described as being a group of glorious amateurs, making it up as they went along, which is probably the key to their success, right? Mm -hmm. They were very creative. And that was the CIA was orig originated in 1947, uh, sort of the successor to the OSS, and originally had a lot of that same character to it, unfortunately has lost it over the years. How did the Cold War era force our intelligence agencies to evolve from their initial form? And, and how did that evolution continue and progress through the war on terror? Well, you know, one of the things that the Cold War did was make them bigger. Hmm. And there are positives to that, right? More capability, more people, more money. Unfortunately, when it comes to espionage, you're talking about really a very arcane business. This is a craft and uh, you can't run it 
as just another federal agency. So while there were a lot of really great things done during the Cold War, you know, like so much of what goes on with our government, right, the bigger it gets, the more cumbersome it gets, the more layers of middle management you get. And unfortunately, I mean, this is the best way to describe it, I think, not my expression, but one I have stolen. <laughs> you end up with a case of bureaucratic hardening of the arteries. And instead of having this nimble outfit that's out there stealing the crown jewels and moving really quickly, you end up with something where you're constantly sitting around waiting for some meeting to take place back at headquarters <laughs> while somebody reviews for the fifth time whether or not we should do something. So it's a lot of positive, but unfortunately you get you get less and less capable of keeping up. And you know, when we got into the war with terror, it, there were again positive things. The gloves came off in terms of fighting terrorists. I worked counterterrorism for years before 9/11. Uh, nothing special about me, myself and any number of other guys proposed operations all the time that were disapproved or after a while, people start to self-censor. Mm -hmm. So it's not they're proposing ops and they're being turned down. They're no longer even bothering to propose the ops because it's okay. It's a waste of time, man. Headquarters will never do this. So, I mean, in that sense, we became much more aggressive which is not to glorify it because a lot of that involves killing people, which is terrible, but unfortunately in this case also necessary because we are at war. But, uh, you know, there are, it, again, it, there becomes, there are issues of bureaucratization and centralization and this kind of thing. I mean, espionage is this arcane, weird little world with some very eccentric unique individuals and it has to be you know it's kind of like jewel thieves i mean you can't <laughs> a federal bureaucracy cannot create the plan to steal the crown jewels it takes some some kind of out there guys and gals who have been empowered to do what is required and the more you subject that to the weight of bureaucracy the more you crush it right be like telling be like having a federal bureaucracy try to paint a great painting or write a great <laughs> novel, right? It's never going to happen. Sam Faddis is with us. He's the author of the book Beyond Repair, The Decline and Fall of the CIA on Hillsdale's campus, giving a lecture of the rise and fall of the CIA. Those are sentiments that you hear more often, certainly the past four years, five years. If I recall correctly, though, your book was written way back in 2009. So th this is a sentiment and a feeling you've had for some time. When did you realize the extent of the problems and how do you identify the major shortcomings in the CIA? Right. So, I mean, honestly, I was eligible to retire at the age of 50 in 2008. I made the decision that I was going to retire at that point, circa 2006. Hmm. Not because I was being forced into retirement or, or anything uh, very much to the contrary. Because it, as of that date, I guess it had coalesced in my mind that it was no longer possible to fix these problems from inside. When I submitted my retirement papers, in fact, the Chief's Counterterrorism Center called me and I asked them to pick, pick them up, unretire, and <laughs> promise me promotion and onward assignment. And I will be honest enough to say I considered it for a moment because I loved the work and I thought it was important. And then I thought, what in the name of God are you doing right now, right? You, you're, you're, you're going to sell out. I will say, however, I mean, we've been talking about this sort of bureaucratization. That was evident to me at that point mm -hmm. that, look, we've lost our edge and we're not – the further I go in this, the more the pressure will be that I too will have to just accept this and sell out. And I'm unwilling to do that. What I didn't realize at that time and what I think has become much worse since then is politicization of the intelligence community because now we're not just talking about inability to do what we're supposed to do. We're talking about intelligence agencies doing things they have no business doing, which is a totally separate deal. was not really apparent to me at that point, has certainly become apparent to me since that, you know, a foreign intelligence collection agency, the CIA, 
should not be within 10 miles of American domestic politics. No charter, blatantly illegal, unconstitutional. We could go on down the list. <laughs> Anybody suggest anything like that to you? You ought to be saying, I think you've lost your mind <laughs> and uh, you need to back up a few feet or we need to go talk to a prosecutor, but that's not happening. Unfortunately, we see that we have seen senior intelligence and law enforcement officials, right, doing things they had no business doing. Mm -hmm. How much do, do the directives of our intelligence agencies change from administration to administration? Or in other words, to what degree are the actions of the intelligence communities, the CIA, self-directed? Well, once you set the parameters say, okay, look, our job is to collect on the Iranian nuclear program. The CIA is then going to run, I don't know if the autopilot's the correct word, but you don't have to micromanage that effort if you tell them to do that. They're going to, they're going to come up with the ops and they're going to run it. But what is set from above clearly is sort of the what the military would call right and left boundaries. How hard are we going to push on this. You want a, a collection on the Iranian nuclear program. Okay. What level of risk are you willing to accept? How aggressive are we going to get? Are we putting people on the ground? You know that Al Qaeda exists and you don't like them and you want them to stop killing Americans. So how far can we go in that regard? You know, if prior in circa 1998, a guy who I know very well who ended up being my deputy in Iraq put together a plan to go to Tarnak Farms and kill or capture Osama bin Laden, who clearly by that point was already a demonstrated enemy of the United States, and if left alone, was going to kill a lot of Americans. The administration in power at that time said, you can go on the ground in Afghanistan, but you are forbidden to kill Osama bin Laden. You must guarantee that you will bring him out alive and intact. So you can infiltrate, go into Afghanistan, pull off this almost impossible operation, <laughs> but you are forbidden to harm a hair on his head. So obviously the decision was made, well, we're not doing that because that sounds like when we bring him back dead, you're going to prosecute mm -hmm, us. Mm -hmm. So not putting our head in the news, guys. So it's at that kind of level that it happens. Uh, Sam Thad is with us. The book is called Beyond Repair, so unfixable. What do you think intelligence agencies here in the U.S. should look like? And if we can't repair them, what kind of reforms or what kind of new start is needed? Well, to use the CIA as an example, the way Beyond Repair is written is really a juxtaposition between the CIA of today, or now 10 years ago, but the same things are true, and the OSS. I use the OSS that was found in 1942 as an example of how to do it right, because they were enormously successful. Why? Because they didn't have a giant lumbering bureaucracy and stacks of regulations, because they were very flat, organizationally speaking. They had an incredible ethic of aggressiveness, creativity, daring, right? The guy who ran the OSS and created it, General Donovan, was in his 60s when he stood it up. He won the Medal of Honor in the First World War, right? This is not a spring chicken. He flew into India, actually, in the Burma theater in the midst of the Second World War to look at the operations of the OSS guys that were operating in Burma. One of The guy who was running that outfit says to Donovan at some point, who at this point is, I don't know, close to 65, Hey, I wish I could show you our operations at one of these forward air forward bases. You'd really see how the guys are operating. Donovan looks at him and says, "Let's go." They climb into a World War One surplus biplane. I'm not kidding. That OSS had bought that had been sitting <laughs> in India for decades since the First World War, and in a two seater with the guy running the outfit. With the two of them, the commander on the ground and Donovan, the only two guys in the plane, and they fly into a dirt airstrip behind Japanese lines. Now, what Donovan collected out of that mission probably is inconsequential, but I can guarantee you that everybody in OSS knew about that within 48 hours afterward. And when you're a young lieutenant and you know that the guy, the man, will climb into a 30-year-old 
biplane and fly into a dirt airstrip in Japanese controlled territory, you saw that the bar set pretty high in terms of well, what does he expect from me, mm-hmm. right? In terms of daring, risk, creativity. It's that kind of ethic that infused it, right? Not PowerPoint presentations or the kind of stuff we obsess with today. If there were a push for reform or an opportunity to to begin again, wh- where would that have to come from? Is that a congressional action? Does the executive branch have to lead that? And if it does happen, how do you think the agencies themselves would begin to react? I don't think you need congressional action. I mean, in the book, I discuss starting all over again. If we are to take a slightly less ambitious approach and say, okay, let's fix what we got. What do you need? You need somebody who knows the place, because if he doesn't know the place, he'll be led around by the nose. And, And then you need a president who will stand behind him or her and say, I authorize you to do whatever is required. And if you hit any opposition pick up the phone because that's what Donovan had. He had a direct line to FDR. If you bucked him, he would literally pick up the phone and and Franklin Delano Roosevelt would be the next guy you'd be talking to. So <laughs> that's the kind of thing it would take. Will there be opposition? Without question. From the second you step, whoever that person is, from the second they step on deck, they are probably going to have to remove a significant number of senior officers. I'm not talking eventually. I'm talking it's nine o'clock in the morning and the guy hasn't sat down yet and there's people packing packing their offices and walking out the door. And then you're just going to have to proceed with a, this is happening and there isn't going to be any debate about this. Like exactly what ops we're going to run so forth, obviously mm-hmm. we can discuss. But this is the direction we're going. There won't be any internal resistance, slow rolling, foot dragging, all the bureaucratic stuff. Will there still be people that try to do that? Yes, and they will have to be removed as well. I think I think that is that is what it would take. I honestly think, however, I mean this may be surprised a lot of people. If you came in and did that, the rank and file would be cheering in the halls mm-hmm. when you walk down. They'd be, oh Lord, I have been waiting so long for this to transform into the place that I hoped it would be. Like People still come there because they think this is a really unique place where I can make a unique difference. And if you actually made those changes, literally, you'd walk into the cafeteria, people would be standing up and going crazy, like, thank you, finally. Sam Bettis with us on Hillsdale's campus to deliver a lecture, The Rise and Fall of the CIA. That was my last question, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll ask it a, a little more directly. How would you characterize your views in relation to the general sentiments of the intelligence community? Are you an outlier? Is there a widespread sense that the current system is beyond repair and must be addressed? Yeah, I don't think it's an outlier at all. I mean, what, you know, I, I am an outlier in the sense that I have made the decision. I made the decision to to walk out the door at a certain point, and I have dedicated myself since to speaking loudly and clearly on the issues. But I maintain contact still with a lot of guys that are inside and a lot of other senior retired guys. I am not in a minority. I mean, you would have not just the rank and file cheering. You would have guys who have retired 10 years ago asking if they could come back if you turned this place into a place that would, the CIA into a place that was really going to go out and run those operations. I mean, look, if you asked these guys to go back into Afghanistan tomorrow, for instance, your problem would be you won't, you know, finding enough helicopters or finding a bigger helicopter to carry them. <laughs> you wouldn't have to run around headquarters forcing people to do that. Why? You don't do it for the money and you certainly don't do it for the recognition to work in a secret outfit. You really genuinely do it because you think this is the place I can make a true difference. I mean, you know, and they don't, nobody talks in terms of patriotism because they don't wear it on their sleeve. But that's actually what infuses them, right? They're there because they want to make a difference. For the average American who might not have access to the insights that you have and perhaps haven't read your book yet, how should they consider the CIA and our other intelligence agencies? Are they fulfilling their obligation? Are they keeping us safer? Is it still operating as more of a net benefit than a detriment to the country? 
Well, I don't know. That's a close call these days. I mean, I, I guess I would say we, we most definitely need a central intelligence agency. In fact, we need one more every moment, right? There, I mean, the, the kind of threats that are materializing, weapons of mass destruction, threats, and so forth, you do not want to live in a world where you don't have that. Hmm. But it's becoming a close call to what extent they are fulfilling their obligations. And now, to what extent we're seeing that, at least at the senior levels, we have individuals who are actually attacking the underpinnings of the constitutional republic. But let's just talk about failures. We're sitting here post-COVID pandemic, assuming it really was a pandemic, but in any event, okay, and in my estimation, it's crystal clear that this thing originated out of the Wuhan lab in Wuhan, China, as a result of playing God by, the, by Chinese scientists in the interest of shorthand. Okay, there's no collection priority in the world that's greater than biological weapons mm -hmm. threats. Mm -hmm. How is it possible that you could have the top Chinese bio lab in Wuhan known to everybody in the business and the CIA doesn't have it wired six ways from Sunday? How could something come out of there and we were caught by surprise? And how is it possible that years later we're still preparing assessments that say things like, well – Maybe we assess with moderate confidence it might have come out of the lab. What does that mean? Well, that means you didn't have any sources in the lab in 2019, mm -hmm. and apparently in 2023 you still don't have any sources in the lab. And that's your whole reason for existing. So that's pretty damning. Sam Fattis, author of Beyond Repair, The Decline and Fall of the CIA, on Hillsdale's campus presenting a lecture, The Rise and Fall of the CIA. You can find him at andmagazine.substack.com. That's A-N-D magazine.substack.com. Sam, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thank you. Up next, as Reformation Day approaches, Mickey Maddox from Hillsdale's Theology Department joins us. We'll talk about Martin Luther and the Reformation. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, an eight to one student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to find us on X, formerly Twitter, for show updates and guest information. We're at Hillsdale Radio. We're joined by Dr. Mickey Maddox. He is Flack Family Foundation Chair and Professor of Theology at Hillsdale College. Dr. Maddox, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. We spoke recently about Martin Luther as theologian, and mm -hmm. I want to spend our time today <clears throat> talking a little more specifically about Luther and his role in, in the Reformation. Mm -hmm. When we speak of the Reformation generally, what do we what do we mean? To reform something that has somehow become deformed. The term Reformation historically is associated with the Protestant movements of the 16th century, but in fact it's much older. And so historians broadly now think of the later Middle Ages as a kind of reforming era. era. Mm -hmm. So you could begin maybe in 1200 and easily extend to 1600 or 1650, and you could recognize that broadly in Western Christianity, in the Latin church, movements of reform are afoot. Sometimes these movements are like monastic. There are certain groups within the church who want to gather together and find a new way to do things. Luther himself, for a period, is one of those guys. He's an Augustinian uh, monk. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes they're more explicit, like reforming theology in the church. The later Middle Ages are really intense in terms of controversy. The biggest controversy that's going on is who has final say in the church? Is it the council of the church, all gathered together, people voting, basically? Or is it in the papacy, in the papal office? Does the pope have the final word? So all that's going on in the background. So reforming for Luther is to be one of just about everybody else. But in his case, the reform led to the split of the church. Therefore, Reformation is a movement that distinguishes Martin Luther in particular. So let's talk about about Martin Luther. He is a Catholic priest. So what's he doing questioning the church? How does he see that as his role? <laughs> oh, questioning the church is something everyone does. <laughs> I would say down to this day. Now, I don't mean to say that everyone stands up and attacks like, say, the settled teaching of the church. But maybe it's important to remember that, like, in Catholic Christianity, you have, like, really hard definitions when it comes to the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, that there is one God who is three persons. You also have a really hard, settled teaching that Jesus Christ in his person unites divine and human nature ineffably in, in a way that uh, we have to believe in, right? There are other matters, however, that are not settled, mm -hmm. uh, issues that are unclear, in the case of indulgences, as I mentioned the last time, indulgences are not clear. There are lots of people who question them, including some of the people who wind up being Luther's opponents. So there is some sense in which he's on a kind of broad ecumenical ground uh, right off the bat in terms of questioning indulgences and calling mm -hmm. for a reform of practice and for a clarification of doctrine. Professors like Luther had the right in the later Middle Ages to do that. He wasn't being a bad boy or coloring outside the lines when he called for those things. Yeah. You told us a little earlier, the, the, in so many words, the environment is kind of right for mm -hmm. this, what would be the Reformation around this time mm -hmm. in the church. So others were saying similar things, thinking mm -hmm. similar things as Luther. Why does he become the flashpoint? Why does he become the guy? He's amazing. He's brilliant. He has a capacity for work like hardly any other human being who ever lived. If you add up the number of pages that Luther wrote over the course of his lifetime, he probably winds up being the most prolific author in Western history. Hmm. So Luther is brilliant, hardworking, devout, loving, kind, also gets angry, sometimes does his best work, or at least what seems to him <laughs> his best work, when he's pretty mad. And so Luther's reform picks up on streams of thought that are already there. Let me give an example. We used to say that in the later Middle Ages, um, the church was in a kind of dark night, that the gospel had been somehow lost, that people were you know, losing their confidence in the Catholic faith and religion. We now know that precisely the opposite is the case. The church on the eve of the Reformation is really doing very, very well. That's not to say there aren't a lot of problems, mm -hmm. but it means that there's a great deal of lay enthusiasm for the faith and its practice. And so reforming the church is something that one wants to do when one loves the church. Therefore, there are a lot of other folks out there hearing the kinds of things that Luther is saying and saying, that's right. Mm. We do need to change that. Let's work on that. This Reformation doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of conversation. And Luther's given opportunities to essentially say, I know I wrote that, but I guess I didn't really mean it. Uh -huh. When does Luther understand <clears throat> and realize that he's past the point of no return? 1521, standing right in front of the emperor. <laughs> yeah, so he's at the gathered congress of the empire with the emperor himself present. They pile up all his books on the table and they say, are these your books? Yes. Do you recant them? Do you completely renounce and reject these writings? Do you take it all back? Luther's response, wait a minute. There's a lot in there that nobody disagrees with. <laughs> what, what do you mean, take it all back? That would be silly. What he's asking for, he's asking for what medieval professors had the right to. That is to say, if you want to accuse me of heresy, go ahead and do it, but then specify it and give me the right to defend myself. He did not get that. And so there's that point where Luther is, it is demanded of him that he recant. And that's too much. 
that's too much. There's a long conversation. It goes on for days, hmm. right? Tr- folks trying to talk Luther into, please, can you just, for the sake of the church, can you just, you know, do this one thing? And Luther's answer in the end is, you know, I can't. Of course, there's that, that settled li- or that line that everybody knows, here I stand, God help me, amen, I can do no other. And whether that line is apocryphal or not, certainly Luther thought something like that that he really did have to stand. And so he realized that, you know, I'm going to be an outlaw. And he was. Talking with Dr. Mickey Maddox about Luther and the Reformation at this point, 1521, what's he going to do? What, does, does he know what, what's going to happen next? Does he intend at this point to sort of form a new church, to split away from oh. the Catholics? What, what mm-hmm. is next for Luther at this point, at least in his mind? Mm-hmm. When? It's left to win. So he's hardly given up. Um, he goes into hiding, as the story goes, in a remote castle. And while there, tries to find something to keep himself busy. So he starts translating uh, the New Testament out of Greek into German. He stays busy. But after a while, it becomes clear that he's safe in returning back to his home in Wittenberg, that he can continue to work and so on. And so he stays there and keeps going until his death is in 1546. So for him, the reform of the church and the split of the church is not something he knows will occur. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as a Lutheran church over against a Catholic church that doesn't happen during his lifetime. And he has some reason to hope that it won't. When there are rumors of a council, Luther busily prepares himself for it. Let's go, let's get ready. Let's say what we have to say. The forces on the other side, however, again, don't allow Luther's voice to be heard. And the difficulty is, from a Catholic perspective, Luther, after the Diet of Worms, where he stands up to the emperor, Luther, after that point, is a condemned heretic. And the tradition is, you don't argue with a heretic, you refute him. Mm -hmm. So listening to Luther is something that is no longer possible. And that, I think is a real shame. Are there others who are helping him during this time, uh, post-1521? <laughs> who is, who's around him? Does he, does he sort of gather other, other Catholic priests who mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. Uh, or unhappy with the church? Mm-hmm. What's happening around him? So what we know is that the faculty Luther joined in Wittenberg at the un- new university there in 1512-1513, uh, that this entire faculty was kind of reformed-minded. So you could say that they were a humanist faculty. This means that they were interested in the new studies. That is to say, returning to the sources of antiquity in terms of culture, rhetoric, literature, and so on, and also to the biblical texts in their original languages. So during the 1520s and beyond, he has colleagues who are right there with him, Mm. just going right along. The most famous, no doubt, is Philip Melanchthon, Melanchthon is a humanist scholar, and a kind of his second profession, we might say, is that of theologian. And he's a very clear writer, has uh, strong rhetorical skills, and is a really bright guy, super hardworking like Luther. And uh, so he also becomes a kind of, you could say, a sort of lieutenant or something, even though his work after uh, Luther's death becomes quite controversial among Luther's other followers. You told us he did not live to see the, the split yeah. in the church, mm-hmm. but perhaps via his writings and thinking, mm-hmm. could he see it coming? What Luther saw coming was the end of the world. Luther had an apocalyptic frame of mind that was also evidence, I would say, of his character as a later medieval uh, Christian. Mm-hmm. And for Luther, there's a kind of crisis that occurs in 1520. In 1520, he discovers that the documentary legal basis for the Pope's ownership of what are called the papal estates, uh, which supposedly came from the Emperor Constantine, that this document called the Donation of Constantine Constantine is a fraud, a forgery, that it's not true. Now, it's not Luther who discovered this, but he read somebody else's work who did discover it, and that is true, right? And so Luther at this point thinks that Uh, The difficulty he's facing is this, in the very heart of the church, greed, vice, viciousness are ruling, so that he connects this with Paul's writing that in the end, 
there will be the man of lawlessness who will be in the very heart of the temple. And so Luther develops from this a very apocalyptic frame of mind, expecting the end of the world relatively soon. Luther is a prolific writer, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but in different times, in earlier times, it might have stopped there. Mm -hmm. We have the printing press. Mm -hmm. What role does this play in, 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 in pushing his thoughts and his writings out to others and then later on, getting to a point where, again, he translates mm -hmm. uh, the Bible in, into German. What role does the printing press play in sort of the rest of Luther's life? The Germans have a word for what the printing press can do. Flugschriften, flying writings. We call them flyers. Mm -hmm. Why do we call them flyers? Because they move really fast. And so the, the case in point would certainly be the 95 Theses, which he had no intention of publishing and disseminating. He was trying to occasion an academic debate. But instead, enterprising printers, remember there are no copyright laws, <laughs> enterprising printers pick those things up and find that they will sell. And so Luther himself becomes a master of the scholar-printer relationship. He understands that printers want to sell books mm -hmm. and that he as a scholar wants to get his word out. And nobody does it better. Uh, Luther dominates early 16th century printing like no other figure. When we think, we should sort of circle back to our initial question mm -hmm. about Reformation in general, what do we talk about? When we think about those uh, names most associated with the Reformation, outside of Luther, who else would we would we talk about? I'm assuming you mean someone like John Calvin, mm -hmm. say other uh, reformers. Yep. Well, there are a bunch. So in in South Germany and Switzerland, there are reformers of a somewhat different frame of mind. Ulrich Swingli, for example who is also an early opponent of indulgences before Martin Luther. Later, John Calvin, Heinrich Bullinger. There are many reformers there. From there, you get the reform tradition that uh, defines itself to some extent over against the reform accomplished by Luther in northern Germany. Mm. Beyond that, there are other figures. Uh, a very famous one would be Martin Bootser, who is a follower of Luther and winds up finally in England where the church there is being reformed. And of course, they have their own very bloody and difficult history. Yeah. Dr. Mickey Maddox, he is Flack Family Foundation Chair and Professor of Theology at Hillsdale College, talking about Martin Luther and the Reformation. Dr. Maddox, thanks for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. You are very welcome. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Adam Carrington from Hillsdale's Politics Department, Sam Faddis, author of Beyond Repair, The Decline and Fall of the CIA, and Mickey Maddox from Hillsdale's Theology Department. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station. You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. The assistant producer of the program is Sam Lair. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.